Uh, the committee of the committee of the whole is in order. We have a quorum. Uh, I'd like to first welcome. We have two individuals wishing to to speak to the body in regards to Bill Number Seventy Seventy Four, and I'd like to first have them introduce themselves, and then we'll start with the testimony. Okay. Hi. Good. Good afternoon, fellow Guamanians, Matapangians. My name is Robin Marquard. I am from the village of Barragada. And uh, good afternoon. My name is uh, Jeffrey Key. I'm here uh, representing my company, Cars Unlimited, and the questionable future company I had planned to start on Guam. Thank you very much. Again, uh, Robin, you can proceed with your testimony. Thank you very much. My testimony will start off by saying the words value, which includes valence and intensity. Valence refers to whether value has positive or negative effect. Intensity indicates the strength and importance of the value and the value's significance. Recently, I wrote a college paper, and the college paper is entitled USA Government's Deficits, Illusions, Tool, or Can It Be Reversed? I started my paper with debauchery four years at a time. Are we all to blame? I got into illusions. I got into tools. And finally, can, America, can American government's deficits be reversed? Finally, I finalized my paper by stating, government's deficits are probably going to be our reality for generations to come. Seriously, consider setting an example and teach your children and ourselves that it is our responsibility to practice moderation and that practice will have positive results. I suggested taking Saturdays or Sundays off and watch how our government and our Mother Earth benefits. I suggested formal activities. Create three to five activities to help end government deficits. Call your local governor's office and ask them to give three reasons why, why their government is experiencing a deficit, which I did, and I got a response. And the responses that I got c comes from the government's office. I asked them, what is the main reason Guam's deficit isn't fixed? The deficit of the government of Guam, this is quote, which is currently tracked at over half a billion dollars resulted in a combination of ineffective historical financial management practices, increasing demands on critical services a growing population, and lack of solid revenue generating and deficit reduction plans implemented through the years. I would state lack thereof of deficit reduction plans implemented throughout the years. So we're witnessing a major change right now, and I congratulate you, and I thank you guys. You guys are you brave, you guys are brave. Now, does the government realistically see a 100% reversal of its debts? 100% reversal of its debts. The government, quote, the government can progressively work towards reducing its deficit as much as possible. However, <clears throat> because the government of Guam will have to meet growing demands of future generations, by building schools, hospitals, roads, and other critical facilities. Indeed, 
indeed, it's going to be costly. Okay? Yes. Three, provide some general ideas to reduce government's deficits. Number one, evaluate the financial impact and feasibility of existing government tax credit and exemption programs. Two, aggressively pursue revenues owned in real property, individual and business taxes, and for other fees or payments owed to the local government. Three, initiate an appropriate process of transitioning numerous public services currently located on private properties to government-owned facilities. Four, seek federal re reimbursement for various education, safety, and public health services provided to citizens who migrate to Guam resulting from the compact of free association agreement between the United States and the federal states, federated states of Micronesia. Five, evaluate certain government fees that have not been updated over the past few decades to reflect the rising cost of supplying technical data, processing and related equipment and services needed to serve Guam's growing population. Six, each government agency and program should be re-evaluated to determine re-evaluated re-evaluated to determine if its mission goals and objects are still valid and necessary in meeting the demands of the taxpayer and clientele it serves any change in organizational structure must consider the impact of such a change in the quality of services provided as well as any cost savings that may result without compromising services. Compromising services, don't, we, don't, we don't wanna do that, right? Okay, thank you. If it is determined that organizational realignment will improve services and or result in efficiency, then it would be imprudent not to move forward on such reorganization. Potential impact on employees must also be factored into the equation and if a reduction in force or reassignment of employees is necessary, then appropriate measures must be taken to ensure that the rights of the employees are protected and any requisite tra retraining options are explored and implemented. Seven, Guam's location and political union with the United States off allows other countries to view Guam as a secure and stable location that provides a doorway into the United States. Guam's economy has relied heavily on tourism and the military as external cash sources into Guam. Guam's unique status augmented with its present telecommunication infrastructure, international air and seaports, and duty-free status allows Guam to open globalized markets in banking, insurance, transshipment, international arbitration, and the trading of commodities. Certainly, they're, certainly, having the necessary trading infrastructure, harnessing CNMI's Commonwealth status, and the compact treaty with the United States will allow Guam to become a Pacific Regional Center, both of which are catalysts for globalization. Okay, unquote. I wanna add my own input quick story of the three talents. God gave his three children one talent each. One talent each. Uh, the first, chi uh, first child of God was, he broke even. I described that as my father. The second uh, child of God was, uh, he, he doubled his, his talent. I described that as my uncle Tony, uh, Antonio Gogui, if anyone knows him. He passed away in 88. Rest in peace. And the third talent I describe as Al Israel, very successful businessman. The reason why I uh, describe these three individuals is they all are humans living on, on, on this earth, all ended up on Guam somehow or another, all had a uh, interest, not necessarily an interest in an area that is now highly developed, but ended up there. And one man, Basically, he's still, uh, he's still, he's, you know, he's still there, and he's kind of doubled his uh, his wealth, so to speak. Another guy, he, 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 the forces, okay, the forces of greed took over, and unfortunately, um, you know, he's not with us now. And then the third guy, 
he, you know, you see him with high rises. And as a matter of fact, he's leasing one of my family's properties in Tumon, lot 5137-6. Okay, Al Israel is leasing that property for my family. Now, getting back to family. Okay, quickly, I just want to state uh, some background of my family, and then I'll get into some ideas uh, that I'd like to uh, offer. Okay, I, I said my name was Robin Marquardt. As, as far as, history, as historically speaking, I am Robin Santos De La Rosa, Leon Guerrero, Cruz, Gogui, Borja, Krivenkova, Matun, Marquard. Okay. Anyway, tithing. There is a concept that is biblical. It's called tithing. The biblical concept of tithing means making God first, proving that you love God and that there is a God, and that you prove that by giving the first 10% of whatever God um, blesses you with. In my case, this is what I do. I have my wallet right here, right? And this is, I put 10% of everything that I get right into this wallet. 10% of my money goes to the church, other charities, and miscellaneous helping others. Okay, so that's something that I do. Um, another, another, biblical, uh, another biblical story that I like to share that might help that I don't think America has been practicing nor Guam is, a, they call it a fasting every seven years. Now, you know, there's always good, if you grow and 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 you don't make room for some falls, you're just going to grow and then when it, when, when it falls, it falls. But if you do a, every six years you grow and then you level off and you get used to that. And then another six years you grow and then you level off. In other words, a repetition or system of growing and then leveling off. Six years, one year, uh, they call it a fast. Another thing that Guam doesn't seem to, uh, th hasn't seemed to employ strongly is recycling. Recycling plants. And it, that might be because uh, we don't have a million people on Guam. Now, this is a topic that I have, I'm very, very sorry to bring this up, but I'm going to bring it up because I, I hear a lot of people talking about this. And before I, I say this, let me, let me le lead up to it by saying this. I went to, I saw the movie 300 last night, and I watched the movie, and I saw there was a senatorial uh, scene, and there were probably maybe 100 senators. And then... I guess you can go back uh, f forward from history to the Roman times when there were maybe a hundred senators. Um, so Guam, uh, the United States, I believe their senators have they have two senators per um, per state, if I'm not mistaken. Guam has 15 senators, and I know each one of you senators are assigned to various uh, duties, so to speak. So maybe we need 15 senators. Maybe we can use less. But I bring that up because I hear a lot of people talking about gri the, these people that gripe. They don't have the, the, the guts to come in here and say something or run for senator. Okay, And I, I told them, I said, why don't you run for governor? I'm tired of hearing it already. But bottom line is they're complaining that there's too much government. Okay. Now, um, I want to share a quick story. With my tithing that I've been tithing since 2002, through that practice of tithing, I have experienced somewhat of a miracle. This miracle is my vowing $27 million to God's work. Twenty-seven. How did I do that? Okay. Quick story is um, I made a vow to God. I said, uh, I'll vow um, $100,000. And then I thought about it. I said, hey, if this is based on faith. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to vow the max. And I said, a, a, a million dollars. And then finally, it grew to $10 million. Now, this is how this applies to this $27 million, uh, $27 million um, vow, and which has been paid already. My family, due to their, as the Bible quotes, evil and wicked ways, they were spoiled, okay? They got land for free in Tumon Bay, which now sits the Sherrod Hotel, the Fountain Plaza, the G-Spot, Wu Commercial Building, the lot that I'm going to talk about real quick, which we lost, and then Al Israel's house and uh, the wedding chapel. Okay, that's my great grandfather, Francisco de la Rosa Leon Guerrero, uh, who gave it to his children, who became, as I described, sorry, but evil and wicked. They didn't do the biblical practices. Anyway, uh, that one certain lot, lot number 5137 5, I found out around, say, 2001, 
that, that land was taken over by the government because we didn't pay our taxes. And who got it? Okay, you know, I'm going to mention names, uh, so, but I have to, okay? Not Judge Lamarena today living, but his father. His father ended up with that property. How did he end up with that property? Because he was able to, he knew my uncle, Tony Gogui. He, he took that property over through some 1988 legislation and, um, and uh, I'm, I'm almost done, so I'm gonna be quick within about two to three minutes. So he took over that property, they, they signed some kind of law and was able to take my family's property. Now, Judge Lamarena, rest in peace, he sold that property for $27 million. Now. If I was, I'm going to bring this up, okay? If I was a Muslim radical, or if I was some, you know, crazy guy that wants to uh, murder people, I, I, it w I would have it in my heart to go and kill somebody, right? For a $27 million loss. Now, instead, I placed that loss from the bottom of my heart to Jesus Christ, who died for our sins. I give him that, that loss, and I say, the loss is yours, and I vowed. See how I vowed it? It started from a tithe, and it grew into a vow. But I made... I made some sacrifices, and the sacrifice in this case was the uh, tithing first, which grew into my giving. Just let it go. Just let it go. Okay. Finally, I want to have, uh, offer a couple of ideas that, that Guam hasn't implemented, and they, they might want to consider doing that. They are lottery. California and all of the United States has lotteries that, um, that the winner... He gets his share, and then a percentage of the rest of the money goes to the state. So I, I like to offer Laddy Lotto. La, make a lottery. There is a lottery, but that money goes to Australia, if I'm not mistaken. Um, also, okay, Guam is good. Guam is good. Making Guam great. That is the slogan. Making Guam great. Okay, now... Finally, um, gradual free increase, gradual fee, free, fee increase. The increases, they were kind of, they were a shock to a lot of people. Um, I'm thinking gradual, uh, let me describe what that means. 100% for the first term and maybe for the first cur current term and the next term, and then maybe grad, uh, then raising it 50% the next term and so on and so forth until it gets to a point where you will really see Guam becoming great. Uh, think of the highest and best hues for these things. And finally, one last quote. I know everything that God wants me to know. That is a quote. That's my personal quote. I know everything that God wants me to know. In other words, right or wrong is up here. And I believe everyone here will understand what right or wrong is. And I am looking forward to this legislation being the catalyst of making Guam great. Okay, thank you very much, Robin. Hello, good afternoon. Again, my name is uh, Jeff Key. Uh, I came here today with concerns in regards to the proposed fee amendments. Um, as a business owner, I have many concerns that many of the proposed fees before you today seem quite discriminant and inequitable. In reviewing those proposed fees, we have some coming from $5 to $10, many that make good proper sense. I'm sure we're not collecting enough to even pay for the plastic that makes up our own, our own driver's license. But I've looked at the fees across the board and read through the legislation and see many inequities. It's as though many of the proposed fees are based on projections from where we see in the business community revenues can be gotten. Some examples I'll cite, and the reason I cite it is I was currently, I currently own and have all the machines that came from GameWorks. In doing so, I've been looking at all the vending and video uh, proposed fees, which prior to the legislation, most all games were set at $25. 
in looking through and reading the legislation, some things are increasing 100%. Some machines and things are increasing as much as 1,000%. These I perceive as discriminant. When you look at those ones which are 1,000%, they're things like uh, Liberty machines. I have none, by the way. But there's a perceived value that is behind that Liberty machine or gaming machines, as they're mentioned. Um, these are increasing 1,000%. And when you th read through many of the proposed fees, many of them read that way. It's as though we've identified target markets that the fees can squeeze more out of the business community and where those fees might be more attainable. Um, this gives me concern. If there are to be increased fees, and I understand the government needs to cover the cost of doing business, but I think it should be equitable to services rendered. Uh, these fees in proposed to vending, there will be no a true additional services rendered for a thousand percent increase. The fee is, is basically a licensing fee on the games themselves. These are stickers affixed to the machine, uh, which are checked by inspectors when they're out. And as the inspectors for that division are also ABC, and many of these games are in those type locations, it's a dual duty call, a double purpose. While they attend to ABC business, they're also handling the inspection of machines and those things within facilities. I don't perceive that the additional increases have services rendered to them. This concerns me. If we're to raise fees, I think they should be equitable. Equitable to the services rendered, equitable across the board, not discriminate in where we perceive greater, greater income levels at the business level. As a business owner, I'm also the owner now of Cars Unlimited. I'm concerned that these fees, in addition to our already strapped business as it is, um, just puts more burden on the business owner. We've all experienced higher power bills, higher water bills, increases, increases, increases in a diminishing economy. We're all struggling on Guam. I think much of why you are in here today is due to the fact we all know GRT figures are down. That's the business community. The business community is already struggling and we're looking to pass on additional fees to the community and I think this will burden many of the business owners this will put further pressure. I think it will burden us in the fact that we'll start having to look at other cuts. As many have already raised prices and there's nowhere further to go, I've struggled for two years to save my employees' jobs. We've cut expenses everywhere we can. We've eliminated phone lines. We turn off air conditioning. We do many things to cut the expenses at our business. Now, with additional fees, on top of fees, I'm going to have to look at other things. Can I afford that extra person? And this concerns me. I think when you all look at these fees, they need to be broken down and equitable. That's what I came today to say. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Okay, thank you very much, Jeffrey. Look to the members of the body if there's any comments or no other or any questions. Okay. And if not, I want to again thank you, Mr. Key and Mr. Marquardt, for your again your presentation to the members of the body. This will be officially part of the record. And again, as we deliberate on, on these issues in regards to Bill number seventy four, I want to thank you for your, your public participation. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. We're just gonna take a one minute recess.
again, uh, we've dispensed with all those that were uh, wishing and to make a presentation to the legislative body in regards uh, to the issues of Bill Number 74 and specific uh, to the uh, license fees uh, and as well as the um, uh, policy changes in regards to the Dave Santos Act. And with that, I've also been uh, uh, notified by members of the administration uh, that they are completed and ready to make a presentation uh, to the body in, in regards to the impact on the revenues as a result of the fees uh, and uh, and the Dave Santos Act, as well as the impact on deappropriations, and are, they are ready to make their uh, their um, presentation uh, on these on these number changes. Uh, they've advised me that they'll be ready to present it, and they requested that we that they present it at 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. So with that, I will be recessing uh, the legislative body to convene at 10 o'clock tomorrow morning again to hear the presentation uh, as proposed by the members of the administration. Uh, Senator Guthards. Mr. Chairman, I, I have no objection to the recess till tomorrow. I do have a question though. Sure. If a, if a member of the public, a community representative, wants to come again tomorrow morning to address this body, will we entertain them? Mm. I guess what we'll do is we'll wait till 10 o'clock comes and we'll see what if there is if there is a you no know, if and if there is anyone there wishing to to make a presentation and then and with that we i will consult with the members of the body right. as well thank you thank you Mr. okay and with that we will recess until 10 o'clock tomorrow morning